Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, The Hartwig Family, Barbara and Peter Gattermeyer, The Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly Food for Thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly in our topics this week. Does Casey's past affect its future? What's the future of KCI? And what about the GOP's future in the suburbs? Plus, roast and toast. But we start with our Newsmakers segment and talk about the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union in Kansas, with its executive director, Dr. Micah Kubik. Kubik is departing Kansas soon to take on a similar post with the ACLU in Florida. Dr. Kubik, welcome to Ruckus. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So what are the essential civil rights the ACLU defends? So the ACLU has been around for almost 100 years now and defends all of the rights and freedoms that belong to every person in this country under the Constitution. Every citizen in this country? Every person in this country. Every person is protected by the Constitution. Uh, citizens have a different set of rights than non-citizens do under the Constitution, but the Constitution is for everyone. ACLU was founded as a non-partisan organization, am I right? Was founded and still is what? Uh, it is still? It absolutely is still non-partisan and non-political. Uh, we have a point of view, we have a perspective that we seek to pursue. Does that point of view more often than not coincide with the Democratic Party view? I don't think so. And I think if you asked uh, President Obama, who we sued multiple times, he would probably uh, disagree with that proposition, too. Uh, we've sued every single president uh, since we've been founded. I'm pretty darn sure we're going to sue every one of them that comes in the future. Too. And the civil rights that we have, that extends to everyone, regardless of party affiliation oh, absolutely. or no affiliation, absolutely. Democrats, Republicans. Republicans, socialists, communists, absolutely everyone independents, has, has whatever. rights and freedoms in this country, and, and we work with them to protect them. And the them. ACLU historically has defended people that you and I might not think of as the good guys, or that's you right. might think of as the good guy and that, I don't, or that's vice right. versa. That's Every, right. Everyone has certain rights in this country, and they deserve to have them protected on, on the basis of their humanity, not on the basis Certainly of their Certainly a famous beliefs. one was the uh, March of the Nazis in uh, was Skokie, Illinois. That's right. The, a, a town where many Holocaust survivors lived, and yet the ACLU defended the right of the Nazis to gather and to march. That's right. Uh, we have always defended the rights of people to express unpopular opinions, and we have defended the rights of people to express opinions that may in fact be popular, but that which we disagree with. Uh, a great example is the work that we do on criminal justice reform, where we work with folks who otherwise uh, don't agree with us on anything. For example, the Koch Industries, the Koch brothers, uh, great partners on criminal <coughs> justice reform, even though there's probably not a whole lot of other uh, ideas that we share. What are some of the key projects the ACLU has undertaken during your tenure? So I think by far the most important one has been the work that we have done on voting rights. Kansas has been on the front lines of the national <laughs> battle for voting rights, of the right of citizens to participate in elections, and passed the single most restrictive law on voter registration that has existed anywhere outside okay, of the that, general Okay, that, that law passed by the Kansas legislature, That's right. voted for by the governor-elect of right. the state, Laura Kelly, uh, simply said if you're going to go in to register to vote for the first time, you have to prove that you're a citizen of the United States and therefore eligible to vote. Is that right? I would disagree. It, it, what, what was the premise of the... So uh, it was that you had to produce additional documentation and paperwork beyond we, anything that any other state had ever done. So in every well, state, you have to prove your citizenship by signing a it? legal affidavit. But you don't have to produce a document. You can just That's sign... Correct. That's correct. A you document sign a saying, yes, I'm a citizen. What if you're not? Is that investigated after you vote? So you're signing a legal affidavit, and if you sign it incorrectly, you are committing perjury but, but who and guilty checks, of a crime. who checks to see if you signed it incorrectly after you've cast your vote? So we know for a fact that voter fraud of that kind is very, very How do rare. we know that for a fact? Because we have done uh, decades of investigations about it as a country. Secretary Kobach in Kansas was the only secretary of state in the country to have prosecutorial power. He used every ounce of energy he had to try and root out uh, this sort of fraud and still came up with, uh, I believe, at last tally, nine instances. Well, well that's a pretty Kobach clear Kobach is not the only person in the country who has the opportunity to look at such things, who says oh, sure. there are a lot of votes that are counted that are illegal votes. 
Lots of people say lots of things. It doesn't make them true. Okay. Uh, you're ahead of the Florida. What do you expect to encounter there? So I think uh, it is well known that they have voting rights issues in Florida as well. <laughs> the most important one right now is that the state just passed a constitutional amendment to make sure that uh, folks who had been convicted of a crime in the past were eligible to vote again in the future. And now we have to make sure that those 1.4 million citizens uh, who have been given the opportunity to register have their rights to protect it. Anybody who's interested in learning more about the ACLU, how do they do that? They can find us at www.aclukansas.org. Hey, it's a pleasure meeting you. It was fun to banter back and forth with you. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. I was going to say come back and see us again, but you're leaving the area. I can still come if back. If you come back to town, Come and visit us. All again. right. All right, sir. Thanks. Thank you very much. That is Kansas ACLU Executive Director, Dr. Micah Kubik. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. John Stevens is president and CEO of Port KC. Annie Presley is an author, publisher, and GOP fundraiser. Sean Saving is a labor activist, part of the Heartland Labor Forum at KKFI Radio. And Laura McConwell is a former three-term mayor of Mission, Kansas. Welcome to all of you. Happy holidays. Good to see you guys again. Thank you. Lots to right. talk yeah. about, so let's get going. Kansas City Star's editorial board is growing increasingly irritated with the recurring delays and burgeoning cost estimates for the new one-terminal KCI, there. saying in many ways it still feels like the project is frozen in time. City council members continue to meet with airlines officials and with each other, trying to resolve the continuing differences over airport construction and contract issues. More than a year ago, voters gave overwhelming approval to the new facility after being assured that smooth sailing, or more correctly, smooth flying, was on the way. Should voters now be irritated by these omnipresent problems or just assume the mayor and council are acting in the city's best interest and all will be properly resolved? And we start with Sean. Uh, I think the only thing to be surprised about here is that people are surprised that this is taking longer than expected. <laughs> I mean, the, you know, the problem here is always these unreasonable expectations that are given up front. The mm -hmm. cost expectations are, ne I mean, none of these projects this size ever come in at their original costs or in their timelines. It seems to me this stuff is, is relatively minor. The environmental review is still going on. It'll be wrapped up in a few weeks. Um, I think the issues that the airlines are having over the baggage handling, that's for the airlines to work out. Hopefully the small airlines don't get pushed out. But, I mean, I don't think there's really anything here that's that big of a but deal. But, John, would it not have been better for the city to prepare people with the possibility that it's not going to open in 2021 instead is going to be 2022 maybe certainly I think they I, I think the city and Edgemore probably should have given more of a range they should have been a little clearer about the complexity of the project but but to Sean's point uh, I, I think that uh, this is all to be expected uh, I don't think it's it's a dramatic uh, delay. I don't think there are things. However, I will also say that I, I appreciate the fact that that journalists in town are asking questions, continuing to push mm -hmm. the conversation sure. forward. It is important to have those conversations and to make sure that we're holding everyone accountable. But ultimately, I think the process is going as you really would expect a project of this scale to happen. But Annie, Mayor James says the city is going to take a second look at what? What's he going to look at? Well, what? they are waiting on an audit, a financial audit, to look at the numbers. So remember, when the airport started, it was under a billion. Now it's over 1.6. So there's a little bit of heartburn. I think it's closer to 1.9 when you figure in the interest rates. You know, it's also well, grown by 40% yeah. in size so and yeah. gates. Um, so so the, there's the heartburn. Building's gotten a lot. They're looking at heartburn right now, and they do need to pay attention to what they're saying to the community and how they're pitching it because this does matter how people feel about it. But I, I would say it's just real quick. I think it's good governance though that the mayor and uh, the airlines are saying let's get a third party assessment of the cost. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's a positive thing to take a little pause, go out to the market, look, make sure these numbers are right, and then come back and move forward. 
Well, I was well, say, well, I'm not sure I'm clear. You mean look at somebody else to, to develop the project? No, 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 no. I, I think I think that that is settled. That is settled. Edge Moore is going be, to do it. It should be settled. The airlines and the mayor have both said we should have a third-party contractors, third-party construction uh, estimators look at these numbers and make sure that these numbers are right. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, it's like not having the fox watch the hen house. Yeah. And I think absolutely that's being a good steward of those taxpayer dollars. Yeah. I, but no. I do agree that they need to probably continue to bring the public along mm -hmm. with what they're doing because agree. they're doing their due diligence which they should particularly since the the dollars that are involved and you don't change an airport you know every other year this is sort of lifetime things that you do mm -hmm. and so I think it's prudent of them to double check those numbers make sure all the stakeholders are addressed I, they probably should be bringing the public along with them on what they're doing because they, I don't think they're doing anything untoward. But Laura says Taxpayers are not paying any of this, or at least that's what we have been told. Why should voters care how much the airport costs? The airlines are going to foot the bill. Because this is a big piece of property in the city of Kansas City, Missouri, and taxpayers do care. I mean, it will affect it will them whether they pay them or not, and it will reflect either poorly on Kansas City or not, mm -hmm. and it can. this can create a whole lot of problems that will create ripples to come if you do not keep your public engaged. Well, it will be users of the airport that will pay for it. So, yes. it might be, Which a I lot mean, of those are the public. Which are going to be the public and, and it's me. City. In so, terms of costs, some, yes. parking costs, airline costs, et cetera, right. ticket costs. And, and it's arguably the most significant economic development tool and, and facility that we have in the metro. And that remember how divided piece. the public was yeah. about whether or not to keep the current one well, and try yes. to reuse it or build a new one. So everybody has well, an opinion. They were divided until, until there was the a vote, vote and it was 75% yeah. or yeah. so saying, yes, we want a new airport. Absolutely. Right. So the, the public is needing to stay engaged. So, Annie, the opening date has been set back by about a year. Uh, do you expect further setbacks? Well, gosh, I don't know. I, I feel like they they think they're going to get started right away. Yeah, the construction has not begun. Groundbreaking has not occurred. The contract apparently has not been uh, signed, so they're looking for a little bit of money right now to continue the design. And we work. shouldn't be concerned about any of this? Well, this is just the way business is done? I think you just got to let the process work. I mean, there's <laughs> nothing we can do about it except encourage them to do it well. So you have no doubts that at some point, someday, maybe in our lifetimes, <laughs> Uh, there will be a new Kansas there, City International I'm One confident. Terminal Airport. I am well, my lifetime. I'm well, yeah, <laughs> I, I have legitimate concerns. There, <laughs> you can understand. I'll wrap this up by quoting from Patrick Tui. You all know Patrick. Yes. Show Me Institute on this program a lot. On the website, he writes: Regardless of whether officials are misleading the public or simply do not know what they are doing, the airport project appears to be a mess. But civic leadership is willing to look the other way. Good public policy is unlikely to result from such an awful process. Is that okay. too harsh? Yeah. Too harsh? Too harsh. Uh, well, too it harsh. sort of leads into your next topic. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you for the lead-in. <laughs> Kansas City's past may have more of an impact on its present and future than we realize. Stars Dave Helling suggests the days of Boss Pendergast rule in the 1920s and 30s still cause political leaders to have what he calls an irrational fear of concentrated political power. Such fear, he believes, makes agenda setting and problem solving more difficult. The city manager form of government in Kansas City, Missouri, limits the authority of the mayor, making him first among equals on the city council with only limited additional powers. The mayor's race is now only a few months away, so nothing much is likely to change before then. But is looking at restructuring government for Kansas City, Missouri, a legitimate idea? I, I think it's. I think it is absolutely necessary, and it and it's beyond time. And not because overall Kansas City, Missouri is functioning poorly, but I think that we, we're we're in a system of governance with a with a, a weak mayor form of government that is beyond time that we take a fresh look at this. But it goes beyond what Helling has said about weak mayor form of government and the city manager's role. It goes back to... Yeah, he really doesn't call for a change in government, does he? He, he sort of telegraphed, I think, that, that there are challenges related to the weak mayor form of yeah. government. And, but I think it goes beyond that. I think that the, the city really needs to look at a, at, a, at a comprehensive look at city departments, what roles our city government are going to play for the next generation uh, in all of the different tools and, and programs uh, that the city does. I just think that's good governance, again, to take a look at that, consider it, open it up to public engagement, 
and lay out a plan for the future. And very quickly, John, for a while before you assumed your new job, you yeah. were doing some work in Wyandotte County, Kansas Absolutely. City, Kansas. There, the mayor is the mayor and chief executive officer. That is a strong mayor form of government, yes. and it seems to work. It, it has worked well. That also was because of the unification right, of the uh, that, was, right. that was done there. And I will say, in, in, in my two-plus years in KCK, having the county executive officer, the CEO, and the mayor in, in one role did lead to an immense amount of streamlining of process, both for the citizen, for the business owner, uh, and just for the community in general. You can get a lot more done. I'm not saying that that should necessarily happen in, in Jackson County or KCMO or in the metro, you know, on the Missouri side, but those are the type of, of things that we need to look at and consider because government evolves. The role of government evolves, the tools that government has and the technology evolve. We need to continue to stay ahead of the curve. Annie, do you think Kansas Cityans are still reacting to the Pendergast era? Well, in some ways they are because most recently we asked again to get control of KCPD yeah. and it's still controlled by the state. So yeah. there was an outpouring of enthusiasm uh, in Kansas to, for cost savings mm -hmm. and streamlining like you suggested. And I don't think there's much of that mm -hmm. enthusiasm in Kansas City, Missouri from the citizens. Sean, what do you think of the form of government in Kansas City, Missouri, the city manager form? Do you like the idea of a strong administrative manager? I, I haven't heard arguments for what a strong mayor is going to do is going to make things all that different. I do think I have issues with the, my issues more with the council and the six at large seats. Mm -hmm. I don't really understand. I, could, I, I see some reason for having at-large seats, but I think having six is too many. I would rather see something more like eight um, districts and maybe four at-large that represent two districts. Um, I think that would, I, it seems that there's, there is an issue where the six at-large folks, like who do you really represent? And it, it, I think there's some, there's some things that can be done there that can, that can adjust. But you know, I think this is stuff that needs to be researched. I think it needs to yeah. be discussed and debated in public. Uh, it's been a hundred years since we've changed this and that, stuff. And that, that's a good example. The, uh, the unified government in KCK has two at-large commissioners. The rest are all in district. Right. That seems to be a, but, a, a but it's functioning a much balance. smaller population. It's a, it's in, a much smaller Wyandotte population, 168,000. And, and we should yeah. point out in, in Kansas City, Kansas, that was a combination of two governments doing Correct. away with the county government, Correct. essentially. So Correct. that's how you had fewer positions and lower right. costs. Uh, there is one person among us who actually has been a mayor of this city, <laughs> yes. and uh, she is right over here. Uh, Laura, what do you think about a strong mayor form? Well, I, I mean, that's how I operated in a mission. A granite mission is very small compared to Kansas City, Missouri, but I do think it's nice when you have somebody who is, who is, who is truly the leader of the community and, and the face of the community, and whoever's mayor has to work well with whoever is your city manager or city administrator, and because that person, you de do delegate all those day-to-day -day operations. Um, and, and, and it is a problem I see with having six elected at large because they're elected at large just like the mayor's elected at large. And you can see a whole lot of posturing that's going to go on if you aren't working together. And, you know, I see this in smaller communities when you have such large councils. Mm -hmm. It is difficult to move the city forward, get, you know, get work on getting your agendas done and getting some type of a consensus and agreement and yeah. but I also think it's, it's good to continue having these conversations to bring them bring mm -hmm. those conversations well, forward and involve the stakeholders but it really needs to be well, kind of ground if up. If you have a strong mayor that's where the final decision often rests and yes. somebody can make that decision yes. and it's somebody elected not a city manager that is correct. who is appointed. All right. And the voters can vote that person out if they don't like it. All right again. Uh, <laughs> The long-held assumption that well-educated suburban voters were loyal to the Republican Party was dramatically overturned by the results of the 2018 midterm elections. Voters put Democrats in firm control of the U.S. House. Of special interest were suburban white women who in significant numbers fled the GOP and moved leftward. This was especially evident in Kansas, where Democratic women were elected to Congress and the governor's office in one of the country's most traditional red states. So for suburbanites and women, is this a temporary dispute with the GOP, a long-term separation, or even a divorce? Annie? I don't think it's a divorce. I think what we're seeing is the traditional urban vote is spreading into the suburban areas. So Democrat, blue, bigger, and the rural Republican areas are pretty much moving that direction as well. So there's going to be some flux in there. But what happened? in this last cycle is that it, it truly was the year of the woman. 
-hmm. more women registered to vote, more women ran, and more women were elected. And truthfully, I just think chicks voted for chicks. <laughs> because I, I don't know about you, I like to have female doctors. I mean, women are finding their power now. They still only make up 20 to 20 percent of the House and 25 percent of the Senate, but they are on the move. And, and 80, 80 plus percent of the women elected were Democrats. Right. On the Democratic about, six, about 60 percent. Yeah, about two thirds, yeah. right. Oh, yeah. And since we have two women, let me go to the other lady on the panel and get yeah. your reaction. So, in, my, in, in Kansas and in, in, in I live in Northeast Johnson County, and I wouldn't say that it, it's a divorce or an annulment or even this huge traditional wave. I think the people in my area, what I hear is, while they may not disagree with some of the policies of the current federal administration, they have a real issue in the packaging and mm -hmm. the messaging and the tweeting mm -hmm. and the vitriol yeah. that comes out. They are tired of that. They don't want to hear it. And then that's so th so that trickles down. And then we had a governor's race where, you know, Chris Kobach is is abrasive, and he would say, you know, okay, you don't like me, you don't like what I'm saying, don't like what I'm doing, and he's, you know, driving jeeps with the guns on them, and <laughs> don't vote for me, and they didn't because yeah. it's, it's, it's Laura. Clear. Well, at least yeah. they listen. <laughs> at least they listen to him. Well, that's it because you know, just because you can doesn't mean you should, and it right. and it gets down to with judgment and packaging. Right. So, and, are, are you saying President Trump's behavior? And I think you're talking about the president. Yes. Is his behavior as distinct from his policies the reason? Sabrina Urban women seem to be I, going to the Democratic Party. I think party. it, well, I don't know that they're going to the Democratic Party. Well, I think they that's, certainly voted that way. Well, in our area, I think that's why they didn't vote for Republicans, because they, they don't red. like, <laughs> yeah, the, the Republican, in, in, the, in Congress, Kevin Yoder's a man, Sharice David's a woman, you know, okay, so they, if they oh. want to vote for a woman, they're going to vote for a woman, and if they're irritated, I mean, here's the thing. If you even say, you know, Donald Trump's not that bad, they weren't going to vote for you. So, I mean, I think Kevin came in behind the eight ball because of things outside of himself to me. And I think there's other issues here. I don't, and I don't think that I was looking at the, um, the detailed polling, uh, exit mm -hmm. polling data from AP and Fox, and still it's not clear how many of these people are new voters. I mean, there's one thing to say, oh, this is what women did, but there's also well, there's a whole lot of people that didn't, have never voted before that are coming in, and so that's an entirely new demographic and new voters and what they're doing is still unclear and what they're going to do in the future is still well, unclear. If they're ever going to vote again. Right. Because right. we have a lot of those the kind of the one hit yeah. wonders will come in mm -hmm. to do this and they <laughs> think they've done their civic duty and then that's going right. to be the end of it. So I don't think it's fair to say there's you know, it's it. Everybody's but, changed. Well, one data point is not a trend to make. So, yeah. uh, but, you know. but most of the polling shows about 46 percent of the electorate still support the president. So that doesn't mean uh, yeah. a disaster. That, oh yeah, in fact, his uh, his up and down are better right now than than Obama's were in his All first right. term. And what, what, let's say certainly there has been damage done to the Republican brand in the 2018 midterm. Would you agree? Is that a fair yes. estimate? Yes. Uh -huh. What can be done by Republicans, if anything, to repair the damage before 2020? Well, if they could get the tweeter away from me, <laughs> yes, as my kids <laughs> say, his phone. he's tweeting too much. But other than that, I think we all just need to band together and recognize that all the economic aspects, the lower taxes, everything that we wanted and hoped for are actually happening. Uh, judicial appointments, all these aspects of this presidency are positive. So we band together on that and try to help with the coarseness that we hear coming out of the White House and, and just hope and pray that something changes in his uh, personality. One final quick question, just, yeah. just yes or no. Will Democrats, should Democrats name a woman candidate for president in 2020? I think they should name the best candidate, and I think there are many qualified female candidates that very well could be elected president in 2020. That was more than yes or no. I, think, I know. I, I think he said yes. And now we, head head yes. For, now we head to the soapbox for Roast and Toast, where the Rockets have 30 seconds each to analyze, sympathize, or philosophize. And we start with Sean. Well, even though Missouri voters rejected so-called right-to-work legislation earlier this year by a two-to-one margin, Republican leadership in the state still hasn't seemed to have gotten the message. Last week, Senator Eric Burleson from Springfield pre-filed another right-to-freeload bill for the next legislative session. It has also come to light that Governor Parsons has been plotting a scheme to implement freeloader laws at the county level. So much for the will of the people and local control. Clearly, the only people who will these corporate puppets respect is that of their billionaire masters. Shame on you and any others in your party who haven't respected the voters' will. Strong letter to follow. Annie. 
<laughs> well, a shout out to the JTF NCR. This would be the Joint Task Force National Capital Region who prepared the uh, funeral for President Bush and all other presidents. In fact, they used the beer, B-I-E-R, that President Lincoln's right. coffin mm -hmm. sat on in the rotunda as well. And I want to just say this is a service to our country and certainly to their family. And Godspeed, my friend George Herbert Walker And Bush. just very quickly, you were and are a friend of the Bush family. You've known them for years. I had the privilege of working and volunteering for them for 30 years. That's awesome. Right. Laura? Okay, well, I'm going to roast the Johnson County Democratic Party because... Um, in this past election, they eliminated a number of women from the Kansas State Legislature, and then they also eliminated a coalition that would really allow the governor, the new, our new governor, Laura Kelly, to really get anything done. And in my view, they chose party over the good of the state. Prime examples of the women they eliminated are Melissa Rooker and Linda Gallagher. Hmm. We lost, they lost some moderates. They may have kept the same number of votes, but they made a big, sharp turn to the left. John? Uh, I'd like to give a toast to uh, a discussion topic today. Good governance, this time out of Minneapolis, Minnesota, with their advancement by a 12-1 vote of the Minneapolis 2040 uh, program, which truly addresses issues of affordable housing for the next generation by eliminating all single-family zoning throughout their entire city and allowing duplexes and multifamily units in a comprehensive way to allow more density, in areas where home prices are out of the reach of the majority of the citizens of their city, I think Kansas City and other parts of our metro really need to consider positive, proactive ways to truly address affordable housing. All right, that is Ruckers for this week. We are back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckets and the crew, I'm Mike Shannon saying thanks very much for watching and good night.